1 Samuel chapter 25, I'm going to begin at verse 2, and we're just going to read for a minute. So just follow along. If you don't have a Bible, just follow along. If you do, open it up. Now, there was a man in Maon whose business was in Carmel, and the man was very rich. I just challenge you to circle very rich. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats, and he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. The name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife, Abigail. And she was a woman of good understanding and beautiful appearance, but the man was harsh and evil in his doings. He was of the house of Caleb. When David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep, David sent ten young men, and David said to the young men, Go up to Carmel, go to Nabal, and, uh, and greet him in my name. And thus you shall say to him who lives in prosperity, peace be to you, peace to your house, and peace to all that you have. Now I have heard that you have shears. Your shepherds were with us, and we did not hurt them, nor was there anything missing from them all the while that they were in Carmel. Ask your young men, and they will tell you. Therefore, let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we come on a feast day. Please give whatever comes to your hand to your servants and to your son, David. I'm keep going. But just note, notice that David's asking from Nabal, who he has already shown favor to, that, he would, that Nabal would return out of what he had in being favorable to David and to his people. And he even said, it's an, it's, this is an important moment because it's a feast day. Recognize the moment. Recognize the opportunity of who may eat at your table. I don't think we get that. Watch what happens. So when David's young men came and they spoke to Nabal according to all the words in the name of David and waited, then Nabal answered David, his servants and said, who is David? I don't know no David. David don't impress me. I'm so rich, I'm not moved by David's presence. I'm talking a little bit right now. Who is David? Can I ask you a question? Who was David? king who was David the king who was David and he was not impressed by the king he was so rich that he was not impressed by the king he was so rich that he was not impressed by the presence of the king he was so impressed with his own presence that he was not impressed with the presence of the king. Do you hear me? He was so rich. Watch this. He was so rich. Now, let me, let me read this little part, and then, I, then I'll, I'll, I'll say this. Watch. Who is David, and who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants nowadays who break away one from, uh, each one from his master. Watch this. What, I, want, I want you to count how many times in the next verse he says, my. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my meat that I have killed by my shears and give it to the men when I do not know where they are from. And the Bible says, be careful because you never know when you're entertaining angels. Shall I take my bread, my water, my meat, the stuff I've done with my shears, and give it to this king? I'm here so somebody can recognize I'm here. I'm here so somebody can recognize I'm in the room. 
I'm recognized. I'm, I'm here so that David can recognize who Nabal is. I'm not as concerned about me and knowing who David is as David knowing who Nabal is. I ain't going to get no help today. I'm so rich. You think rich people are willing to be generous. Often rich people are rich because they're greedy. There's those that you don't know they're rich that are generous people. They got a lot of money, but it don't show. There and there are those people that not only uh, like to flaunt that they're rich and want their presence to be acknowledged, their richness to be acknowledged by others, but in the opportunity to give what they have, hold on to it tighter because they believe it belongs to them. Without ever understanding that everything that we possess, we steward, we don't own. Shall I give my stuff away? Wait a minute, wait a minute. I come in, I come in this morning for God to thank me for being here. I ain't been in two Sundays, so he ought to welcome my presence this morning. He ought to be glad I showed up. Pastor Jason ought to be excited that I'm actually here today. I'm in the room. Oh, I, I came today. Grace me. I grace them with my presence today. So because I'm here today, when I come forward, he better give me what I've come for. I told you it's going to be a little bit of chastisement, but I'm trying to awaken So I won't offer up my sacrifice. I want to offer up my praise because it's, it's me that's in the room. I've come to have my hurts healed. I've come to have my mind cleared. I've come to have my circumstances shifted. I've come to be given to, not to be a giver. Do you hear me? I really, I mean, if we're honest, in our religiosity, we really don't come for a Lord. We come for a distributor. I think of it, the picture I have right now is kind of like a distribution center and the difference between a truck that's bringing its load in and a trailer that's coming in empty to be filled up to go out. And I think what's interesting is that um, the trucks that come in and give out empty themselves to receive. He said, don't they know where I don't give it to them? I'm not going to give it to this David. Who is David? Who's David? David needs to know who I am. And I think that's how a lot of times we approach. God, don't you know I'm here? What I've come for this morning, don't you hear me? Don't you hear what I'm hungry for, what I long for? I need this to happen in my life. I need this to shift in my life. I need this to work out in my life. And you know what? Here's the thing is I know about God, trying to learn it on a greater level, is that God desires to want to overflow into our lives. But there is a process. 
And there is a strategy and there are parameters and there is structure because God has given us some very specific ways about we, how we enter the holy place. So David's young men turned their heels and went back and they came and told him all these words in verse 12. Let's keep reading. Then David said to his men, every man gird on his sword. So every man girded on his sword and David also girded on his sword and about 400 men went with David and 200 stayed with the supplies. Now one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, look, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master. And he reviled them. Kind of reminds you of the story of the master who sent the laborers into the vineyard. And they killed the servants. And he said, well, I'll send my son. I will send a precursor of my presence coming to see how they'll receive what I sent in order to determine whether they'll receive me. So David sent his servants and they turned them back. And so David's like, okay, now I see. Not only, hallelujah, are they willing to receive me, but they are actually enemies of me. And I wonder if in fact, we often are enemies of God. And our prayers sometimes are put on block because we have not actually approached God in a way that creates an open door. I'm not going to get a whole lot of help and claps and celebrations. Probably not a lot of views, whatever. David went back and told his servants, gird your swords up. Watch, I want to show you a shift. David's like, I'm coming to be a blessing. I'm coming to have a feast at his table, but now I'm coming to bring him war. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will cause him to be awakened somehow. He will either be awakened by what I've sent before my presence, or he'll be awakened by the war that I come with. One way or the other, he will be awakened. Nabal will know who he is dealing with. Nabal will have to recognize whose presence he's in. And he will either receive me and welcome me, or he will be at war with me. And I think we have to make a determination. We can call ourselves the people of God, but if we do not enter into a place where we properly receive him for who he is, maybe at times we are at war with him. Rather than being in a place that we are actually in an intimacy. So one of the ser servants goes and tells Abigail, says, look, let me, let me tell you this. David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master, and he reviled them. But the men were very good to us. We were not hurt, nor did we miss anything as long as we accompanied them when we were in the fields. And, 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 and they were a wall to us, both by the night and, and, and the day, all the time we were with them, keeping the sheep. Now, therefore, know and consider what you will do, for harm is determined against us. Against his household, for he is such a scoundrel that one cannot speak. Now watch, this is where a shift happens. And if you got a highlighter, a pencil, a pen, everything you need to do, this is what I want to get after right here. What happens in the next bit? Then Abigail made haste. And she took 200 loaves of bread. And she took two skins of wine, and she took five sheep that were already dressed, and five sayas of roasted grain, and 100 clusters of raisins, and 200 cakes of figs, and loaded them on donkeys. And she said to her servants, go on before me and see that I am coming after you. But she did not tell her husband Nabal. And it was as she rode on the donkey that she went down under cover of the hill, and there were David and his men coming down toward her, and she met them. Now David had said, surely in vain I have protected all of this fellow has in his wilderness so that nothing was missed of all that belongs to him and he has repaid me evil for good I'm going to be honest with y'all it's the church it's not the world 
May God do so and more also to the enemies of David if I leave one male of all who belong to him by morning, uh, by morning light. Watch this. If I leave one male, if I leave the seed bearing capacity of their life living, if I leave the ability for them to multiply by morning, if they multiply in their present state of being adverse to the presence of God, they will produce illegitimate sons that do not know how to carry the presence of God. And so I will enter in by war and I will smite their seed because they do not know whose presence they're in. They do not know how to receive the glory of the Lord. I will not allow them to populate the earth. I will smite their seed. And they will not multiply. Oh, watch. The church has been at labor. It's just not been fruitful. It has been occupying territory with eunuchs. If you don't know what a eunuch is, go look it up. I'll spare you the embarrassment right now. A church full of eunuchs because we have not recognized whose presence we are in who desires to dine at our table how to properly receive it and so we have been at war with him <laughs> God help me he has repaid me evil for good and may I do so one male of all who belong by morning. Watch. Now when Abigail saw David, I want you to notice her posture. At first it says she makes haste. Now she dismounts quickly. God likes an eager repentance. Watch, watch. She fell on her face before David. She recognized whose presence she was in. Watch. She fell at his feet on her face. If this don't need to be the posture of the church, I don't know what. Watch what happens. And she said, on me, O Lord. On me, let this iniquity be. Please let your maidservant speak in yours. On me. She threw herself at his feet in humility and repentance. She humbled herself in the sight of the king. She took upon the burdens of all that had been in her household that were adversaries to the presence of the Lord. She absorbed them herself and threw herself at his feet in repentance and in hunger that his mercy would fall upon them, that he would spare her people, that he would spare her household, that he would spare her family and all that were connected, all that belonged to them, all that they had, the seed of their life, that they would, he would spare by mercy because she was willing to approach the king with a gift. She was willing to enter the king recognizing who was there. She was willing, hallelujah, to come with all that she could gather together and bring in his presence. And she did not just bring her praise, but she brought her humility and she fell at his feet and she begged for his mercy and she repented with all. She wasn't even a wrong in a wrong place and she begged she took it upon her and begged for the mercy of God watch this so that his ears would be opened please let your maidservant speak in your ears and hear my words please just to gain entrance to your ear I'm going to bring you everything I got and I'm going to throw myself at your feet and I'm going to humble myself in repentance just so you give me your ear Here's what I know we, we got to see. Before she ever throws herself at his feet, she brings a gift worthy of a king. I want you to look at the shift 
of somebody who has a right heart posture to recognize whose presence they're in. This is where I want to bring an encouragement that we represent the entire body of Christ, although we might only be a small part. And if we, because Nabal did not have to turn, but because Abigail, because a part of them, because some of them in that household, because some got it, because some recognized whose presence they were in, because some recognized who they were approaching, because some recognized who wanted to come and sit and dine at their table, if some will get it and some will begin to gather together a gift worthy of the king and throw themselves at his feet and begin to cry out in repentance and humility and mercy. Hear us, O oh God. Where you are at a place that you were wanting to destroy my household, I pray in mercy now that you open your ears to save it. But she never opened her mouth to say, hear me, before she presented a gift worthy of a king. Let me teach you for just a second. In verse 10, you have Nabal's arrogance and his unwillingness to recognize the presence of the king, and he would not provide an offering. In verse 18, Abigail shifts the posture of the church. Look at her honor. Here's what I need you to, to hear. And, 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 and so if, 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 if we need a revelation, you know, uh, well, I won't say it like that. If we, if we need revelation simplified, I'm talking about our praise, our giving. And when I say our giving, I'm not just talking about this. This matters, but I'm talking about our giving from ourself, our praise. If, 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 we, if we honestly understood right posture and structure and order, we've been so religiousified that we call the first hour of service worship when in fact it should be praise. And I'm going to tell you why. Because worship, watch, worship is not a song. Worship is obedience. And so it is a part of our worship to give a king his honor. It's a part of my obedience to obey, to recognize what he desires, how he desires to be invited in. I don't feel like I'm getting nowhere. So my loaves of bread and my ephahs of flour and my lambs and all, it's my, it's, it's my mindset that I recognize I'm not coming so that he can recognize I'm here. I want him to know I'm here because of the gift I brought. I want him to be able to identify me beyond anybody else because of the gift I brought him. Oh, y'all ain't hearing me right now because you're missing scripture. See, there was a widow with two mites that he recognized her because of the gift she brought. He recognized Mary when she walked in a room full of religious people, rich people, dignitaries. But he picked her out to write about because of the gift she brought. She did not wait to be wined and dined. She did not have, walk in with an attitude that said, I deserve a place at a table. She brought the most expensive praise that she could give. And she fell at his feet. And she began to massage his feet with her hair and cry over the dirt on his feet with her tears. She brought a king, a gift worthy of his presence.
First of all, the only part of this that's for us is the word. The only part of a church service that's you, that's for you, is the word. And in our theology, in our religiosity, we come in, watch this, we'll only show up for church service because I need a blessing. And when I get there, I'll only respond when I've been moved. And the Bible says Abigail moved with haste. I heard the Lord say last week that, that I ought to have people that can't wait for Jake to get done with the announcements because they up front hungry, ready to clap. That they can't wait for him to shut up, that he feels the pressure of having to move quickly through the announcements because they're so ready to clap their hands in praise, they can't stand it. Haste. I know who's in the room. Wait, I know who's in the green room. And I want him in the building. Wait, wait. Well, but he's already here because we brought him. No. He's here because he's God. He'll manifest because you gave him a gift. The only part of a church service that's for us is the word. And watch. The Lord told me the word is often of no effect because the garden has not been prepared to receive it. He said, you feel like you've been trying to dig up things for years that won't produce a harvest, and it's because their heart isn't properly prepared to receive the word it's been given. The truth is, is this thing right here, is for this, a gathering, an, an assembly of the saints is for him. What, can I give you a greater picture? What's it doing? When we get together and we're drawn together with one another, it is a part of the preparation of the bride. We get together and it's like, well, there's another piece of the adornment. She's getting beautiful. Not yet ready. For the shout to where we will be joined together, but she's getting prepared. She can't wait for that moment to where there is a sound that goes out that we will be joined together in matrimony. But my God, she's anticipating the day by her preparation. She's so eager for my presence that she makes haste to prepare. What's the preparation? How do we do our hair? We clap a little bit louder. Yeah, yeah. Come on, come on. Come on. How do we how do we put on the jewels and, and we shout a little bit more? Yeah, yeah. How do we let him know that we're we're hungry for that day that we get to enter that chamber and be intimate with one another? Is because we begin to shout a little louder and we begin to stomp a little more and we begin to make a sound that we acknowledge the presence of the Lord. I'm not here. Watch a bride. A bride's like, I'm not, I'm not here. I'm not here so that he'll, he'll come to me. Understand the Jewish wedding. He's away preparing the intimate chamber. When the bride is ready... The father of the bride sends out a shout that it's time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the bridegroom does not come to her chamber. She leaves her father's house and goes to his. Right. 
a gift worthy of a king. What you bring a king. Understand this. The king, the king owns everything. You're not bringing him something he doesn't have. Watch this. He says, if they will not cry out, I, I own rocks that will. But I did not build a rock to experience my manifest. Watch. But I will get my praise because I'm do it. They just might not get their manifested glory. If they won't praise me, I'll cause a rock to because my purposes will prevail. So what you bring to a king does not give him something he doesn't have. You're not doing him a favor by giving him a gift. You need to understand. The opportunity to bring a gift. It is an opportunity. You're not bringing him something he doesn't have. What you bring to him shows him the measure of his value in your eyes. Abigail said, I'm giving you all I could gather because that's how much your presence is worth to me. I'm coming with haste to throw myself at your feet and give you my praise because this is how much you matter to me. I recognize whose presence I'm in and whose presence I can access even more up close. And I'm going to acknowledge that. I'm going to let him know before he ever speaks on my behalf or against me. I'm going to even preface my coming with my gift. Y'all ain't hearing me. I'm going to preference my coming to his presence with my gift. I'm going to send my gift before me. I'm going to make my gift go ahead of me. The Bible does say your gift will make room for you in the presence of kings. And I'm going to cause my gift to go before me to make room for me in the presence of kings. And what we have done is perpetrated that word in believing we would have doors open before mayors and presidents and we left out the only king that matters and maybe we don't have access in the city places and municipalities and bosses and CEOs because we have not yet caused our gift to go before a king I pray it never leaves the ringing of your ears that my praise lets God know how much I value him. Amen. God is looking for a house that will enter this place with anticipation that I'm not here so that I can have my broken heart mended. I'm here because I brought my gift to give. What I know is in the presence of a king when I give my gift, his ears are open. His ears are open. We got God with shut ears. Because we've told God by our lack of praise and by our, 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 our incredible religiosity. You matter very little. I matter much. You owe me this. 
You owe me this. You owe me your presence. You owe me your healing. You owe me your response. You owe me open doors in my job. Play. You owe me repair to my marriage. You owe me these things. He's like, I'm, I'm scanning the earth to and fro looking for a worshiper. Who will worship me in spirit and truth. Watch. First, they recognize who I am. And then they respond with the truth of what I require. So I'll enter with praise. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with is it a song we sing or do we really understand the, the structure of the words? It's a principle. I will enter the courts. The courts. The courts. The, the courts. Not even the holy place. He said when you get out of a doggone car and you enter the front door. You're in the courtroom, hallelujah, the courtyard of the court. You better lift up a praise. I ought to hear people walking in the door. Thank you, Jesus. I praise your name. We magnify your name. We exalt your presence, God. We desire you, O oh Lord. Enter his courts with praise. We come in, bless me, Lord. Get bless, bless me, God. Bless me, God. Bless me, God. God's like, when you gonna bless me? Because the gift you bring shows me how much I matter to you. The gift you bring lets me know how, how you really see me. You never hear me. Both naturally and spiritually, you never enter the presence of the king without a gift. It's why we won't even give our, our resources. We think we own it. We're in their balls. My job I work for, my paycheck I took in, my da da, my da 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 da. Watch this. And the tithe, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't ever teach on this. I don't ever ask you about money for nothing. But I'm going to teach you right now. And here's the problem is that we will stop at the tithe, not realizing that the tithe is simply just being obedient. But the offering is the, the offering I bring, the offering above and beyond my tithe. My offering is my value that I trust whose presence I'm in. And I know he owns it all. And although I release what I feel like I don't have, I know he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. So I bring him my offering. We're talking about new beginnings and overflow. He's like, you just bringing in your tithe and I got next week taken care of. But you want me to overflow your life? Show me how much I mean to you. I ain't gonna stand up here right now and be like, you they ought to be five people sow thousand dollar seeds. But in truth, they probably ought to be. And we ought to sow thousand dollar seeds with our hand clap and with our stomp and with our praise. We ought to be sowing thousand dollar offerings everywhere we go. Because I recognize. Presence of the King. I gotta hurry. Listen to me. Honor determines your reward. Honor determines your reward. Listen, that you ought to write that down. That's a kingdom principle if you ever got one. Honor determines your reward. What and how you honor determines what you receive. It opens the ears to the king. These church services are nothing about 
about us, but it's his presence, his word. But the king doesn't come without honor. What, what honor determines your when I don't bring a heart of honor I'm not prepared to receive an honor's reward when I'm not prepared to bring honor to a king I'm not prepared to receive the king's reward it's why many of our spiritual wounds Don't receive a pregnant word. The only thing in a service that's for us is the word. But the way we enter with honor determines what we receive from the word. And you can either leave pregnant. Watch, Jesus teaches a parable and he said that man, they were scatterers, scattering the seed. And some fell on rock. Some fell on rock. The enemy snatched it away. Hard heart. Some fell on dry ground, rough ground. And when the sun shone, it was zealous when they first heard it. But as soon as the sun, the hot sun began to burn. Birds come along and they, he said, and there are some, and this is where, where we are. This is rich folk, religious folk. He said, and there are some that fall on ground and the tares spring up with the wheat. He said, and that's the affairs of life. They're concerns that are concerning to them more than I am. It's them folk that think that their stuff matters. They're occupying my, my space with all their imaginations and their distractions from their affairs and what they got going on. I need my this fix and that. God, I need you to do this and you got to fix this and you got to change that and I want to be blessed and I need them. And they just, the tears just swallow that word up. He said, but a ground that has been broken open and is empty because the ground has nothing to give up. It's just open to receive. A ground that's been cultivated because it knows it's about to be sown into. That's the one that will produce a harvest sometimes 30, sometimes 60, and 100. But uh, honor determines your reward. Let me just really quickly just finish the story. She said, let me speak in your ears. 25 says, please, Lord. Don't regard the scoundrel Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, your maidservant, did not see the young man of my Lord whom you sent. Now, therefore, my Lord, as the Lord lives, as your soul lives, since the Lord has held you back from coming with this bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hand, now then, let your enemies and those who seek harm for my Lord be as Nabal. And now... This present, this present which your maidservant has brought. I didn't come to you without a present. Let it be given to the young man who followed my Lord. Please forgive the trespasses of your maidservant. For the Lord will certainly make for my Lord an enduring house because my Lord fights the battles of the Lord and evil is not found in, your, in, in you throughout your days. Yet a man has risen to pursue you and seek your life. But the life, my Lord, shall be bound in the bundle of the living with the Lord your God and the lives of your enemies he shall sling out as from the pocket of a sling. 
And it shall come to pass when the Lord has done for my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you and has appointed you ruler over all the Israel. She ain't doing nothing but singing his praises. She bringing him gifts and pumping him up. Bringing him gifts and telling him, my God, you're awesome. Everything about you is incredible. You're, there just ain't nothing like you. Man, the Lord is for you. Who can be against you? My God, there's something just in, magnetic and incredible about who you are. I'm so thankful to be in your presence. You see what I'm getting at? Go on down, 32. Then David said to Abigail, blessed is the Lord God of Israel who sent this day, sent you to meet me. And blessed is your advice. Blessed are you because you have kept me this day from coming to bloodshed and from avenging myself with my own hand. She turned his hand against the entire house. We want him to turn Anderson. Maybe we ought to start bringing gifts. For indeed the Lord God lives as he has kept you back from hurting you unless you had heard and come to meet me surely by morning light no males would have been left in Nabal. So David, watch this. So David received from her hand what she had brought him and said to her, go in peace to your house. I have heeded your voice and respected your person. I got to tell you about this right now because when it says I have heeded your voice, it basically says that I hear your sound. What? 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 I received from your hand your gift. It opened my ears to hear your sound. You ready for this? When it says, and respected your person, it literally means to lift the face or the head or to forgive. I received your gift. I heard your sound and I lifted your head and forgave. I heard you because you approached me with honor. I turned my ear to you because you brought your gift. It turned me towards your cries and I've had mercy. And now, daughter, lift your head. Lift your head, for I'm bringing my salvation. It is the word Yeshua, salvation. Listen, bring me your gift. What did she do? She threw herself at his feet. She cried in her humility, brought her gift. Open your ears. He said, I have received your gift. I've seen your humility. I have heard your cry. Now lift your head. I'm healing your land. Chronicles. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and make a sound and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, repent, then I will hear. My ears will open up and I will hear from heaven and I will lift up your head. Now Abigail went to Nabal and there he was holding a feast in his house. He was holding a feast because he was the guest of honor. Like the feast of a king. He was holding a feast in his house like the feast of a king. He made himself a king. Nabal's heart was merry within him and he was drunk on religion. He was drunk on religion. Therefore, she told him nothing little or much until morning light. So it was in the morning when the wine had gone from Nabal and his wife had told him these things that his heart died within him and he became like stone. Watch, watch. Then it happened. After about 10 days that the Lord struck Nabal, it happened. He struck his adversary. And he died. Watch this. When, watch, 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 watch. 
what you have been married to. You have been married to an adversary of God. But when there is a willingness to bring him a gift worthy of his honor and his presence and you thrust yourself at his feet, he will come in and suddenly strike the head of the adversary. Now watch, 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 watch. In the presence of that, it has left you husbandless. You once dwelled in the house that was like a king. A perverted house. One that roamed roaring like a lion. But he wasn't. There's only one lion. When David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord who has pleaded the cause of my reproach from his hand of Nabal, and he kept his servant from evil. For the Lord has returned the wickedness of Nabal on his own head. And David sent and proposed to Abigail to take her as his wife. You see what happens when you bring a king, the present, worthy of his presence. All of a sudden, he's like, my God, I'm going to enter into a covenant. My Lord, we're about to enter into an intimacy. You have done something to my heart. You have captured my heart where I want to make you my bride. When you recognize whose presence you are in and you are hungry, hallelujah, for my partnership, then... When the servants of David had come to Abigail at Carmel, they spoke to her saying, David sent us to you to ask you to become his wife. Church, we have to quit being the hooker. We have to quit being the hooker. Somebody ought to want to wife us up. I don't know about this, but I pray that right now in this very moment, it's 1242, it's late, the kids' ministry is already mad at me. We passed doing our being able to do our lunch right now. We're going to go eat it anyway. But here's what I know is that I think that we ought to we ought to recognize whether we receive the word or not and begin to stand up and give him a praise that he is due and let it begin to change our perspective that this is how we enter in the presence of the king that we will no longer enter the presence of the Lord without a gift worthy of honor somebody ought to shout to the king in this place
if this is how we will enter, we'll never have another dry day and rejuvenate again.